ethnic Chinese from across the world are bound to China by blood, according to the Chinese Communist Party. Not to invoke Godwin's law, but why does that sound eerily familiar? Welcome to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. China, under the CCP, is like a giant slime mold slowly spreading across East Asia. And the Chinese Communist Party wouldn't have it any other way. Sometimes the only justification they need to uh, reunify an area is that it was a quote-unquote historical part of China. Other times it's a matter of blood. And I don't mean bloodshed, I mean ethnic identity. Hong Kong, with its 7 million people, has essentially been subdued and annexed by China ever since the CCP imposed a national security law on the city-state in 2020. And the Chinese armed forces constantly threaten military action against Taiwan and its almost 23 million people. The CCP and their affiliates have repeatedly referred to Hong Kongers and Taiwanese as compatriots, and both have been called part of the Chinese nation. Meanwhile, in 2019, Xi Jinping gave a speech commemorating the 40th anniversary of the 1979 message to compatriots in Taiwan by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress. In it, he said that all our compatriots in Taiwan are members of the Chinese nation and should be proud of their Chinese identity. He really doesn't mince words, does he? But the Chinese Communist Party's definition of the Chinese nation doesn't end at Hong Kong's sky rise and the beaches of Taiwan. Instead, Chinese leader Xi Jinping has described all ethnic Chinese across the Chinese diaspora as members of the great Chinese family who would never forget their homeland, China, and never deny the blood of the Chinese nation in their bodies. Not to invoke Godwin's law, but why does that sound eerily familiar? Now, according to Beijing's own numbers, there are an estimated more than 60 million Chinese living outside of China across nearly 200 countries and regions. This is the Chinese diaspora, and it includes Chinese citizens living abroad as well as ethnic Chinese with foreign nationalities. It's estimated that 80% of all ethnic Chinese living outside of China are nationals of other states. I wonder why on earth they ever left China in the first place. The Chinese diaspora doesn't just include recent immigrants to Western countries. In places like Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, Chinese communities have existed for centuries and make up large minority groups. In Singapore, where the first Chinese settled as early as the 10th century, ethnic Chinese today even make up the majority of the city-state's population. As a result, these ethnic Chinese are not citizens of China. Now, typically, when you think of a citizen, you might think of someone who has citizenship in a particular country, a passport for that country, and perhaps even a sense of loyalty to that country. But that is not how the CCP views citizens of other countries with Chinese roots. In fact, she considers it the responsibility of Chinese sons and daughters at home and abroad to play a role in uniting all Chinese people to achieve the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Well, I guess if they all moved back to China, that would be one way to handle the demographic crisis. But I think it's more about using the Chinese diaspora as a way for the CCP to influence every country around the world. Xi's definition of Chinese nationality based on blood and tied to a sense of common purpose is very typical of dictators. In fact, it's not very different from fellow autocrat Vladimir Putin's view of the unity between the people living in Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. In an article from 2021, Putin says about the people of these three countries that our kinship has been transmitted from generation to generation. It is in the blood that unites millions of our families, for we are one people. It's those ideas that Putin blended into his own selective version of Russian history to claim that Ukraine, with its sizable Russian minority, is not a real country and that Ukrainian Russians needed to be protected from the neo-Nazi regime running Ukraine, which somehow has a Jewish president at the top. Yes, we were all a bit confused about that. But then on February 24th, 2022, we saw where Putin was going with this. And while Beijing is hopefully not looking to steamroll into a neighboring country with a large Chinese minority population, Chinese leaders have also long used ethnic minorities abroad in their own power games both in the Qing Dynasty 
and the Republic of China government that succeeded it in 1912, considered all Chinese people, regardless of their location, as Chinese subjects and nationals. During the Chinese Civil War, beginning in 1927, both the Chinese nationals and the Chinese communists vied for the support and favor of Chinese diaspora communities. But with the communists' victory in 1949 and their subsequent consolidation of power in mainland China, the CCP's attitude toward the Chinese abroad began to change. By the 1960s, they looked to well-established Chinese communities in Southeast Asia as conduits for exporting communist revolution. Communists will communist, after all. According to Associate Professor Ian chong Jia, who teaches Chinese foreign policy at the National University of Singapore, this created a degree of friction and sometimes animosity between ethnic Chinese and China on one side and local governments on the other. You mean the local governments didn't want their minority ethnic Chinese communities importing communism? Who could have guessed that would possibly happen? And who could have possibly guessed that the situation would turn violent? In 1965, thousands of Indonesian Chinese were killed in anti-communist purges, following an alleged failed coup that the government blamed on local communists. For decades afterwards, the Indonesian government forced Chinese Indonesians to change their names and even ban celebrations of the Lunar New Year. And in Malaysia, hundreds of mostly ethnic Chinese were killed in race riots in the capital Kuala Lumpur after a Chinese-led political opposition made electoral progress in the 1969 election. The riots led to a state of emergency and the introduction of race-based policies favoring the majority Malays over the minority Chinese. With the death of Mao Zedong in 1976 and the beginning of a new era in China under Deng Xiaoping, the CCP changed its tune, however, to instead encourage the Chinese outside China to invest in the PRC. So while Xi's recent rhetoric is a change from the Deng Xiaoping era, it's not really a reinvention of Beijing's policy towards ethnic Chinese abroad. Rather, it's a return to a more imperial and assertive CCP vision for Chinese diaspora communities. This vision of ethnic Chinese everywhere as part of a grand Chinese nation often goes hand in hand with calls for Chinese abroad to tell China's story well. And some have heeded that call. For years, the wealthy Singaporean businessman, Philip Chan, encouraged his fellow ethnic Chinese in Singapore and Hong Kong to unite and, with the help of Chinese officials, work together to spread positive messages about China and expose the hypocrisy of fake news from the West. He also helped a public gathering organized by pro-CCP figures during which participants chanted, Support Hong Kong Police, Protect Hong Kong, Justice Will Win. Dare I ask where his wealth came from? But Chan's activities drew the attention of the Singaporean authorities, who in February designated him a politically significant person that has shown susceptibility to be influenced by foreign actors and willingness to advance their interests. Although it was not specifically mentioned which foreign actors' interests Chan was advancing, there wasn't really any doubt who the Singaporean authorities were referring to. The funny thing is that while Chan caught the attention of the authorities in Singapore, other members of the Chinese diaspora have caught the attention of the CCP by refusing to support the so-called Chinese nation they're supposedly part of. For example, the Hong Kong pro-democracy activist Agnes Chow. She was arrested and jailed for her involvement in the massive Hong Kong protests of 2019. After serving seven months in jail, she was forced to go from Hong Kong to China for a propaganda tour to learn of the motherland's marvelous developments in exchange for getting her passport returned. In February, she became wanted by the Hong Kong police after she decided to remain in Canada and not return to Hong Kong. But even in Canada, she still expressed concern for her safety. That's how long the CCP's arm truly is. One target of that arm has been Kenny Chu, He's a former member of the Canadian Parliament for the Conservative Party and has spoken out about Beijing's involvement in his native Hong Kong and foreign interference in Canada. In Canada's 2021 national election, the CCP allegedly leveraged the Chinese diaspora there to vote him out. This was the CCP directly meddling in Canadian elections. Chu called the idea that ethnic Chinese must play a role in the CCP's global plans or tell China's story well insane. 
He compared it to the UK suddenly demanding that everyone with an English last name swear allegiance to the British crown. But I mean, in all fairness, when you are elected unanimously as the supreme leader of a country, it does feel more like the coronation of a monarch than the election of a president. But therein lies part of the problem for Xi and his vision of a greater Chinese nation. The Chinese diaspora is not playing along with his call to tell China's story well. Probably because most ethnic Chinese, unlike Xi, do not equate the Chinese Communist Party with China. China Uncensored is dedicated to actually telling China's story well by telling the truth about the Chinese Communist Party. And that ain't always easy. That's why we need your help. Head over to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash China Uncensored. You can support us for as little as a dollar a month by setting a monthly limit. Help us keep calling out the CCP, which is not the same thing as being anti-China. And as a thank you, I'll answer one of your questions on the show. Today's question comes from Chuck Ferguson. You state openly that you have been hiding controversial content in your gaming channel. Can the YouTube censorship algorithms really be that stupid? Is that all it takes to defeat YouTube censorship? How does that work? Hey Chuck, yeah, dealing with YouTube suppression isn't easy. I can't tell you how many times people have written to me saying YouTube secretly unsubscribed them from the show. So yeah, I had the idea to get around YouTube's algorithm by hiding controversial topics and gaming content on my new channel, Gamers Unbeaten. It's still a little early for me to tell how it's going. So far, I haven't had the same problems I've had on this channel, with videos being demonetized or removed by YouTube. I don't know how good YouTube's algorithm is at reading the words I actually say, but I'm sure that day is coming. So for now, all I can say is it's something I'm trying and I hope it does work. In fact, you can click here to see the latest episode about the game Withering Rooms. It has absolutely nothing to do with Epstein's Island. Not a thing. Don't even know why I'm bringing that up. Let me know what you think. Thanks for your question and your support, Chuck. You can join Chuck on Patreon by clicking this orange button. It really does make a difference. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.